We'd like to uh, play one more selection for you and uh, bring up a special guest, our good friend, trombonist, composer, James Harvey. Whatever happens, if we can reach one of you people out there and convince you not to be a musician, we'll have done our job. I have to create work for myself now because there's no longer a functioning music scene in the city. There are four or five or even two or three people that I can call on the phone and say, hey, you got work for me. It doesn't exist anymore. It's not my job to run around saying how great I am. I don't know how great I am. I don't, you know, I don't know whether I'm even any good or not. But the fact is, I decided to make it my life. He taught himself to read when he was four years old. You know, he, um, I mean, he, what, spent a week in the first grade? You know, he was, it wasn't just music. He was bright, very, very bright. I think the first time we actually got together was, uh, he was 13, I was 17, and I just started playing a rock and roll band the year before. And he called me up because he needed somebody to play with. And he came over with his trombone. His simple ideas he would come up with were astonishing for a 13-year-old. One of them was something like, you know, Johnny wet his pants. Johnny wet his pants. And he thought that we could do something interesting with that. And it struck me as being you know, beyond precocious that somebody at that age would bring up something out of our childhood and already be trying to improvise with it. We were playing a place called the German Club, which is right around the corner from here, actually. And in walked this guy who looked like a, like a Hell's Angel with like spike, you know, like spike cuffs and but he had a trombone case with him. It was like the, just the, it was just so incongruent at the time. It was like, who is this guy? He's like, you guys mind if I sit in? I'm like, yeah, sure, man. <laughs> so nobody knows what to expect. He pulled out his horn. He just absolutely just ripped it and, and, and blew us all away. We like, oh, who is this guy? He had some green satin pants he was really fond of for a while. And I remember that he was responsible for a car accident in Italy because he was walking down the street and people craned their necks to get a look at him and ran into, he caused a rear end fender bender there. James grew up in a, in a very poor family and he was acutely aware of that and felt that coming out of Duxbury, Vermont as a kid from a farm who had been bailing hay when he was just a kid you know, and he really had to work hard for his dad. And they had been quite poor. He felt some stigma behind that. My mother and I were very close. She was a, she was really a brilliant musician in her own right. Um, she was a fantastic singer. She was a really good piano player. She could sit down and bang out Fats Waller. You know, she could, uh, and she could go to the church and play the organ, and her taste was immaculate, you know. And, um, you know, she's, she's really the person I have to thank for everything in the world. 
wind instruments were not considered in good taste for women musicians. It's a different story now. Many of the girls in the Rutland High School band <laughs> play horns with different types, including Miss Ellen O'Brien above, who is shown playing a slide trombone. <laughs> When I was about 20, 21, 22 years old, somewhere in there, um, and living up in upstate New York with some woman who was putting up with me for some reason, um, I realized that what I needed to have was a tone that was nobody else's but mine. And uh, what I did for that month was I would get up in the morning and I'd listen to Billie Holiday and I'd listen to Charlie Parker and I'd listen to Miles Davis for, you know, an hour or so. And then I would go in this little closet, like about really, you know, maybe about four feet by six. And I would sit there and just just blow on my mouthpiece for a half hour and then I would pick up my horn and put the mouthpiece in my horn and then I would literally spend eight hours a day in that room just trying to find my sound and it took took about two months but when I got out of that room I knew I had something nobody else had I just knew that I could put the emotion through my horn um, and, and sound like nobody else. I would hear him play trombone and it was just like in your face like holy shit like never heard a trombone played like that I'm not sure I'm ever gonna be able to play a trombone like that the thing I do remember from my mother is that if you were playing an instrument you were supposed to make it sing um, and I, you know, maybe that's because we all sang first, but James could make the trombone sing. Okay, so as far as the trombone goes, let's take this ruler. Okay. And let's say we're in second position, we're playing A. And then we want to go to third position and play an A flat. So I'm on the six inch mark here. And I'm going to go to A flat. So that's putting me from six inches to just short of eight inches. So we're talking about one and seven eighths of an inch. If I were to go a sixteen. No. 16th of an inch this way or a 16th of an inch that way. It's going to be out of tune. It's about the same thing happened to my mother at about the same age that it happened to me. Um, her teeth all of a sudden got really weak and she lost most of them in the space of about a year or two. And that's what happened to me. Um, So, I don't know if it was genetic, but I do know that once I lost one tooth, then it put that much more pressure on the other teeth, and then it just became an accelerating process. And um, I tried to play with dentures in, 
I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. I had a couple of rooms. I sold both of them. There wasn't really any reason to carry them around anymore. And it just kind of made me sad to look at them, so I just got rid of them. Plus, they are both, you know, they were both really good instruments, and they, they should, they, they need to be played. You know, they don't need to be mementos hanging on my wall. They, they're there to be played. James is one of those people that's uh, a survivor and resourceful. And I'm sure if he, you know, if he cut off his hands, he'd still find a way to make music. It's funny. He would, I remember James would, would uh, he'd be doing, doing heroin and, and smoking camel no filters, but he wouldn't eat meat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I really didn't consider my day complete unless I'd had some narcotics, some cocaine, some marijuana, and a drink or two. And um, I don't really miss any of that stuff. I have a clarity of mind that I really wouldn't trade for for that. <laughs> Besides being just a junkie, I'm a knowledge junkie. I'm really like just driven to learn all the time. You can just see by looking around this apartment, all these freaking books I have to cart around everywhere. I made a real study of how to write a melody. How to write a melody that people will not be able to forget. If you look at the tradition of Western music since Bach, all the greatest composers have written string quartets. And the string quartet is the ultimate compression of music. If you can write a beautiful string quartet that really hangs together, you are a master musician. I went back and I started with Haydn, and I went to Mozart, and then I went to Beethoven, and I went to Schumann and Schubert, I went to Brahms, and then I went straight through Bartok, Schoenberg, you know, all the, all the masters who have written string quartets. I learned so much about melody from them. How you construct a theme that hangs together, but at the same time, you have to have a sort of framework where it meets certain expectations, but then there also has to be an element of surprise. That's the challenge, is to have the continuity and then the surprise. James has always had something that great jazz musicians have, um, which is a sense of phrasing. And this kind of phrasing has a lot of lyricism, um, his playing as a trombonist and now more as a pianist and drummer and certainly as a composer has a good deal of passion. Um, it's not passion for passion's sake, but it's just soul. It's just plain feeling and soul. And that's a, that's a rare thing. That is something that is very difficult, if not impossible, for people to learn. But it's something that James has always had. This one particular year, seven of my friends died. Um, and I was not an old person at the time. So it was in this atmosphere of constant death that I wrote that piece. It took me 
actually years to write. I wrote the left hand part on the piano in Carla Blaze's basement. <laughs> and it must have been back in like 1979 that I just came up with this idea. I thought, okay, all you really need are two ideas. And you take those two ideas and you turn them upside down or you turn them around backwards or you turn them around upside down and backwards and what you come out with is an organic unit not that you're just going to mechanically go from one to the other and you have to have the element of surprise stuff that doesn't really fit in there. It took quite a few years turning this over in my mind until one day I was able to sit down at the piano and first work out the ideas and then second work it out to the point where I could play it. You know, that, that's something that, that I'm really proud of. You know, I've always had sort of an inferiority complex about my piano playing. Uh, just because there are some technical things that I just can't do that a lot of, that somebody who has formally studied the piano can do. But, um, on the other hand, it's perhaps there are some things that I think of doing that a classically trained piano player wouldn't think of doing. One thing, this is, this is funny, one thing that has kind of held me back in my life is that I'm, uh, I'm very sensitive to noise. And I'm also very sensitive to not wanting to impose on other people, so I don't... You know, a lot of times I've found myself not really being able to practice comfortably because, because I don't want to subject people. So it's it's a great development that now they have these digital keyboards and you can just plug your headphones into them and play at any time of the day or night without bothering anybody.
when you take a really big project like you know renting a big hall getting a good piano getting a, somebody to record it getting the publicity out as well as you can um, making all the phone calls to the people you need to make phone calls to you go there and you do it and then you're finished and you're packing up and you're just kind of like well that's over now what that now what feeling can just be a really empty feeling So he wrote this song when he was living with us and um, I brought it to the band that I was playing with and we decided to put it on this record that we had that we were working on and we recorded the song and I wanted James to hear it. So I brought him a version of the song before we mastered it and pressed the album and, um, and he said that it wasn't his song. I had changed the vocal for the song. Um, I had made each of the four verse lines identical, but there's actually a change. So when I played the song for him, he said, that's, you know, that's, it's nice, it sounds good, but it's, it's not my song. And we actually had a conversation about, um, you know, him putting, putting his name on it. You know, he he said, "Well, you you know, you can put that on the album, but it's you know, it's not it's not my song." So, and it was my you know, I was thinking, "Well, what are we supposed to do? I mean, it's not my song. I didn't write it. I changed one note, but it's still your song." But he wouldn't agree that it was his song, so we were sort of stuck in this uh, in this pickle a little bit. So we went back to the studio and. Um, we had to re-record the whole vocal track to change that one note. Um, and we used to joke that it was the $350 note because that's how much it cost <laughs> to change that one note. Um, and the so the line was, She's not the one who's gonna bring me to my knees. She's not the one I aim to please. She's not the one that's the $350 note. She's, that's it. there's anything that can reveal a person more than the music that they write. If that music is honestly what they want to write. <laughs> I mean, if I was writing a Campbell's Soup commercial, that wouldn't reveal anything about me.
but I don't write camels and commercials. He's not the one who's gonna take my breath away. He's not the one who has the say. As Roscoe Mitchell once said, there's a lot of neglected artists out there um, and people may not be paying attention to them, but they're not being stifled either. And actually they're growing like weeds. So the positive thing is that somebody with James's incredible will to live, to survive, and um, like any plant that uh, managed to, to live in the cracks in the concrete um, and bloom. He's going to keep doing what he's doing and it's only going to get better. I had been drinking too much and not sleeping and I was exhausted and I couldn't eat and I went to see my doctor and he said, um, be in the hospital. And I spent a couple of days there. And then um, I foolishly came out and uh, did that concert, <laughs> which I never would have done if I hadn't really needed the money. Because I knew that I couldn't do it. My mind and body were not synchronized, and my body was just too weak and shaky, and my mind was just, just really foggy. You know, they'd, I'd been sitting in this hospital getting stuffed full of medication for days. I've actually been calling the people that I know who were at that concert and apologizing. <laughs> and saying, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have even done it. Because I was too sick to do it. One of them said he thought it was absolutely heroic that I even tried to do it. <laughs> but I don't really think there was that much heroism involved. It was really just, um, financial panic that was involved. I suppose that can breed a certain sort of heroism. <laughs> it's not like saving somebody from a burning building. So I was sort of trying to save myself from a burning building. You know, there, there are times in my life when I just get overwhelmed by circumstances, particularly the last few years, just dealing with this relentless poverty, 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 and all that that entails. It's just really worn me down. It, it would wear anybody down. And it's, um, it's really hard to see a way forward, you know, a way to get out. Most people's response to this situation would be to save up some money, pack up and go to some big city and start promoting themselves and making, trying to make money. And I'm just not going to do that because I don't like to live in big cities. It's not really safe for me to live in big cities. It would be really easy for me to get caught up in some kind of bad scene. Uh, because I don't feel comfortable there. I 
I'm really fortunate in that um, that I grew up in a specific part of the country and I have a specific patch of land that is home to me. And when I get too far from that land, I don't feel right. And I, I recognize that that's something that's very precious and it's something that most people in America don't even understand. How you can be just part of a piece of land. Uh, that land is not part of me, I'm part of it. That land, my whole family is a part of me. And I'm a part of my family. For me to ultimately feel like I'm even part of the world sort of rests on my relationship to this land and to my family and to the people that are my broader family. Yes, you're a very friendly guy. You're a good guy. I like you. Yes, I like you. I think he's shocked that he's made it this long. I think we're all kind of shocked that he's still alive. Well, I didn't think he'd make it the way he was going. I don't know, shocked is the wrong word, but it's not the right word, but I'm surprised. <laughs> Grateful. I think there's that syndrome of wanting to be taken care of just for your talent, and that just is, doesn't it just doesn't work. It doesn't happen. You know, having mm. talent isn't enough. You gotta work it. And it's not like anybody's ever gonna swoop in and rescue. It doesn't happen. Why don't you just improvise, you know, like a response to the line? Okay. The first time. And the last time when we're going out, hey Dennis, when we're going out on the bridge, you do the same thing. Just improvise a response to the bridge line. Da, 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 da. Yeah, and girls. So he'll take it the first time, you take it the last time. Just coming in and going out. He'll, he'll take it on the in head, you take it on the out. the responses you yeah. Okay. Playing the drums is, is the most fun of anything. And I think that's because it's so physical. It really involves your whole body. It's also just the, the feeling of, of drive and driving the band. You have to play with authority, you know, it's total authority. Whether you think of yourself that way or not, you just have to do it. <laughs> because uh, <clears throat> nobody else in the band can do the things that you do as far as creating the whole space in which things happen. I don't need to know how the balance sheet checks out until I'm done with this life. I'm not going to know how it checks out. Maybe I've learned all that I can learn from being a musician right now. It'd be good to learn more about how do you communicate with people on the non-verbal level. But it could very well be that just this is not the time for that. There are more important things for me to learn right now. And it brings it back to what I think almost all of us are trying to do every day, which is just to look at what our life is bringing to us and have to it and live it. James Harvey, ladies and gentlemen.